Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, September 8th. We are picking up our third lesson in Romans 9, 10, and 11. We've covered chapter 9 extensively, which is Israel past. We're moving into chapter 10, which is Israel in her present condition. And we will look probably at least into 11, if not all the way through in this class, to Israel future. Does Israel have a future? Did she blow her future? Does God give up on her? Is there a time status, uh, timeline that she has to adhere to? We've got many questions, and Paul's going to address those and even some others. So we'll just start with him. We know Shaol, Paul, Jewish boy, Jewish background, who has come to faith in Messiah, Yeshua Jesus, as his Savior. He is the one who is speaking. And when he speaks in the beginning of chapter 10 and says, in your version, either brethren, or it may say brothers and sisters, he is referring to believers. He's not referring to his siblings out of his fleshly family. In fact, we know nothing of his siblings, if he had any. But what he is referring to is Gentile believers as well. Um, and, and in this case, really more Gentile believers than Jewish believers, but any of that, that would be Jewish like him would be a part with him. But this is a term of affection. He loved these people. He had always wanted to get to Rome and to meet them personally, but he had a lot for them in the Lord. And so that's the affection that you're hearing. The best texts will read, and I'll read it for you to the keyword. The best texts read, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them. That's the key word for them, is for their salvation. Now, remember when Paul, Shaul Paul wrote this book to the Romans, wrote this letter to the Romans, he didn't stop and do chapter and verse. He didn't stop and say, okay, we'll end here, we'll have class next week. He wrote one long letter. We've divided it so that we can find it easily. So I can tell you all, turn to Romans 10 and you get there quickly. You don't scroll through wondering where we are. So you have to understand that them refers to who he's been talking about. So if you look back at the last few verses of chapter 9, you realize that he's been talking about Israel, that Israel has stumbled out over the stone. We talked last week about how the stone is Messiah. The stone is Yeshua Jesus, also called the rock in Scripture. That they found the cross and a fence. They expected a throne, not a cross. It's a rock of snare, as it's put in the end, verse 32 for them. But Shaul Paul brings out, any who don't stop at that, who go past that, who come to, to the truth, will see this is nothing to be ashamed of. And they will not be ashamed for putting their faith in the rock, in the stone, in the one that though he was crucified, yes, that was for a reason, a purpose, and that was to be our atonement for our sins, he also will come back and rule as that king sitting on the throne that they expected. So when we see and understand clearly that, that he's saying his heart's prayer, his cry, and remember we started that in, verse, in chapter 9 in the early verses also, his prayer to God is for Israel to be saved, for Israel to come and understand who their Messiah was. Now he's speaking, when I say that he's speaking to Jews and Gentiles as brothers and sisters, we commonly refer to them as the church the called out assembly, the ecclesia. So he's saying to a body of believers, that's a good safe way to put it, to the body of believers, his heart's desire is that all of Israel join and become part of this body of believers, that they come to know this one that he loves so greatly. But remember his burden is so great for his people that he says, if I could even give up my salvation for them, he would be tempted to do so. Wow, that's love, that's love. So his desire, his pleasure, what would give him satisfaction, what would be, uh, I'd say it, this is an all-consuming desire. His whole heart, his, he's just caught up in it. It's such a desire. This isn't a, a simple sentence. This isn't just, you know, I wish I could have dessert today. This is something that, that's literally driving his life. He's, he's, everything he's doing is because of this heart bent. He's in prayer. Great place to take your heart's desires. Great place to take your heartaches. What's heavy on your heart? Plead it out to the Lord. And that's what prayer is. It's supplication. In this case, supplication of another one's needs. He's, he, he's not above saying, God, I'm begging you. 
that Israel get saved. Now, he doesn't need to beg God because that's not what it takes for God to act. But God, remember, puts on our hearts desires. And when we come into that fellowship and that walk with God, we have come close to God's heart. What we're hearing, I believe, is God's heart through Sha'al Paul. And that is not a rejection of his chosen race. It's that God is crying out for their salvation. He's pleading with them, and we're going to see as we end this chapter how he's pleading with them for their salvation. So I think Sha'al Paul has come into fellowship with, with Jehovah God through the Messiah. I'll put it that way so you see the deity for the salvation of the Jewish people that were to be the ones who had the very oracles of God, who had the words of God, who were to be his priests to the nations so that they would take it to the world. That's the hard desire. I don't see any room in this for God to be rejecting Israel as is taught today in replacement theology or supersessionism, whichever name you hear. His desire, his prayer, Paul joining God's heart is that the Jewish people would not stumble over the rock of offense, not stumble over Messiah's death, but realize that's the key to their salvation so that they might yet be saved. They need to see and understand that it's not a hopeless situation. It's not hopeless because Messiah didn't set up the throne. That's coming in God's timing. How many of us run ahead of God in his timing. The hardest thing in the world, I think, for believers is to wait on the Lord. As soon as you hear that word wait, how many of you bristle inside? How many of you say, oh, yes, I know what she's saying. It's so hard to wait on the Lord. And we see that all the way through scripture with many of our key Bible characters. There's a time and period when they have to wait on the Lord. And it just behooves us to be in prayer, to be patient, to allow the Lord to work his way perfectly because if we jump and try to take things in our own hands, all we do is make a mess of it. Just ask, well, let's say, let's ask Abraham and Sarah if they regret having a son before the son of promise. Let's see if Rachel, Rachel and Leah have some regrets over what they did, when, especially Rachel when she was crying out. God did finally open her womb. But what about what took place ahead? We could go on and on through scripture. But staying on track, we see now, this is his, his whole heart cry. It goes on with that in verse two, for I testify about them, about Israel. Now, notice what he says about Israel. He doesn't trash them. He doesn't say, they're terrible people, they're hard, they're stiff-necked, let's forget them. I hear all the time, oh, those Jews are so stiff-necked. Well. Honestly, Dora said it. Dear beloved Gentiles, are you any better as a whole? <laughs> I think it's common to humanity. But anyway, he says, I, I testify. I, I can record. I can be on the, the witness seat. I can put my hand on the Bible and I can swear by God in heaven. Here's his witness. What is he testifying about Israel? They have a zeal for God but not in accordance with knowledge. That's the sad part, okay? Now, Sha'al Paul has this right to testify. He has this right to be called as a witness. Why? Because he's been one of them. He's still one of them. He's still Israel. He's, he was born Jewish, raised Jewish. He was a zealot of the zealots. He was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. He tells us that in other places. He was so bent on doing God right and doing God a favor and following the law that he's out there killing the Christians thinking he's doing God a favor. So he does have that right to testify that he knows their heart. He's been in their situation. He, he can speak with, with authority. And he's saying that they, they don't have knowledge. Um, how does he say it? Let me use his own words. In accordance with knowledge. They love God but they're not loving God out of an experiential knowledge. They, they don't know him in that personal way. This is a full knowledge. This would be a correct knowledge. This is vital. They had an insufficient knowledge of God's way of salvation. They didn't see the fulfillment that Messiah is the way to salvation, so they refused that 
future revelation of God. They stopped short of it. They stopped short of his program that he was bringing to them salvation through the one who came out of their loins, the one who came in their bloodline. Yeshua, Jesus, was Jewish. He was one of them, but living sinless. He could be their redeemer, but they're missing that. They don't know that. They're still seeking God in all their rituals and all of the external in the letter of the law. And they were so zealous. They were so caught up in the letter of the law. Let's do it so right, so exactly right. Let's dot every I. Let's cross every T. Let's not miss anything. And so giving them their whole selves to it. But they missed the whole spirit of it. They missed what the law was to be showing them. So that it's they head can't. knowledge, not heart knowledge. It's head knowledge, not heart. And it's also not even the head knowledge of what God had promised. They didn't see that, that even by knowledge that Yeshua Jesus was the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecies. They were like, no, he can't be. I still hear this to this day. I'm not going to use a name, but there are a couple of rabbis in my life who we are trying to be a, a light to. And I heard one recently say, Yeshua couldn't be our Messiah. He failed. Where's his kingdom? He didn't, he didn't do the job. There's no way he was our Messiah. Sadly, that's what they think because they've got this partial knowledge. Messiah is to come and sit on the throne. But they don't have the knowledge that he was to come also as suffering servant. They're ignoring Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, Micha um, 7, 5. So There's other chapters. It's partial knowledge and head. it's all head. Oh, and a head. Yeah, partial knowledge in the head, totally missing it with the heart, even oh. though they're zealous for it. Rhonda, you have to unmute yourself to ask your question. Still trying. Hit your end. There you go. Are, are the Jewish people looking for a virgin bird? Because I never hear that. They don't like that part. <laughs> if you didn't hear the question she asked, are the Jewish people looking for a virgin birth? They should be. On the basis of Isaiah, they should be. But they try to argue that and say that it doesn't mean virgin, it means a young woman. Well, I'll ask you, keep it in context. A young woman giving birth is a sign? How many young women in your lives have given birth? That's natural. That's not a sign. A sign is something supernatural, something that, that gets the attention. A young woman giving birth doesn't get attention. It happens every day, all the time. So, yes, they should be looking for it, but they'll try to argue it down. There are two words in the Hebrew. They try to say it's the, the young woman, not the virgin word. But when it was quoted in the the uh, the New Covenant, in the Greek, which was... Um, taking it from the Hebrew, they use the word and the only word that's for virgin. And when you leave it in context, it's virgin. And I have heard one that I was personally witnessing to have a fit at me, and I will not repeat it in his words, but in essence he was appalled by the thought that God would put himself into the womb of a woman. He, again, you see how they miss the they're looking at a big picture and they're missing. My point was, if God could create the world out of nothing, is he not able to put seed in a woman? That's and right. did he not do that for a purpose? To be kinsman redeemer, he had to be born of flesh. He had to be fully God to be able to deal with sin, but he had to be flesh to redeem flesh. The first Adam's redeemed by the second Adam. He had to be of the Jewish line, bloodline, so that he could be kinsman redeemer. Because kinsman redeemer, and we'll get into that a little bit in uh, further down, either in, in 10 or in 11. Kinsman redeemer means he had to be Jewish. He couldn't have come from, from the line of Ishmael. He had to come from the line with Isaac, with Jacob. We even know through Judah, Judah because it's promised that the one from Judah would have the scepter, would have the king's um, wand, what do you call it? <laughs> that, scepter. That, scepter was right. Scepter. scepter. I don't know what else to call it. It's a scepter. So all of this, they need to see and recognize all of their scriptures. But sadly, they'll argue away what, they, what, what they're bothered by. And in all honesty, many of them do not even study those scriptures. 
they skip over them, some without realizing, some by choice, but they, they argue other scriptures and really what they argue is this rabbi's opinion versus this rabbi's opinion. And that's why one of the best witnesses to them is to constantly draw them back. It doesn't matter what man says. What does God say? What does the word of God say? And I know personally one who was a witness in Israel among his people for many, many years. He's just recently, well, fairly recently gone home to heaven. But he even had favor among the Orthodox in his neighborhood, in his community. And every time when the young men who are studying, who are in the yeshiva, in the schools, when he'd have opportunity with them, he would make them open their own Bibles so that they couldn't say, oh, you're using a different Bible. He would read them the words out of the Bible. He would read them the living word of God. And they'd be, wow, we didn't know that was in there. But then sadly, their next sentence so often was, we've got to go ask the Rebbe, the <laughs> rabbi. We've got to go get the rabbi's opinion. And then when they get the rabbi's opinion, he'll have the excuses to turn them away from God's word and the man's reasoning. This is why it's difficult, but we've got to bring them back in, bring them back in, bring them back in. The best witness is the Word of God. Sure. Let the Word of God speak for itself. That's why I will, with a Jewish person who will let me, I will heavily go into prophecy. Prophecy to me is one of the, the greatest ways to prove the authenticity that this is the Word of God, that this isn't just a book. It's not to be put on the same level with the historical books. It's not to be put on the same level with anything else that man has authored. It's inerrant and it's proven by prophecy. Where else can you have everything that's been prophesied fulfilled exactly? And if they'll listen and they, they follow the steps and you build that case for Messiah on scripture, they do finally come to that point where they have to say, you know what, whether I like it or not, this is the word of God. And usually they come to the point where they'll say, okay, Yeshua Jesus, he was Messiah, but he wasn't God. That's still not good enough. If they don't recognize him as God, oh if God. he's just a human, then he has no ability to save. A human can't save another human. That's right. The only one who can is the sinless son of God. So we still have to bring them to that next level where the scriptures show them that, that Yeshua Jesus is God himself. And when we get them to that point, if they're fair and they're honest, then they will say, like our Rabbi Maurice Levy, a blessed memory, home in heaven with my daddy. <laughs> and he, he said, my dad had been taking him through scripture after scripture after scripture. Every week for their lessons in Hebrew, they studied the scriptures. And his own words on the day of his salvation was, I can no longer refute the scriptures. I'm ready to accept my Messiah. Hallelujah. The Word of God is where we stand. The Word of God is, is undeniably perfect, inerrant. Well, Shaul Paul said it, it's right for judging us. It's right for correcting us, for giving us instruction. Everything we need is in the Word of God. And this is what we're bringing out and what Shaul Paul was saying. Take the whole Word of God. Don't take part Take it all. And I'll tell you honestly, I will argue with anyone who wants cafeteria style. As soon as you say that you don't have to believe this scripture, but you want to believe this scripture, I'm going to say to you, and what gives you the right to say, this one's not, this one is. It's either all or it's or none. none. You know, I, I will not tolerate a pick and choose because yeah. that's open for whosoever. And if God left it open for whosoever, well, look at this world that's trying to do it their own way. And I hear that song, I did it my way. <coughs> well. That's why we have so many denominations, because they take, pick and choose what they want to believe in. And they take it out of context, mm -hmm. leave it in context. Can we apply the Word of God? Absolutely. <coughs> the whole Word of God is for us. The whole Word of God is not to us. There are scriptures that are to Israel. There are scriptures that are to the church, the ecclesia. And if you leave those in context, you understand 
then can we take that and say that God's applied that to my heart? He gave me that to help me in this circumstance. With absolutely, it's living, it's powerful, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. This is Hebrews four. Yes, we can apply it, but know it in its originality. Know it in its context. Know it to who so who he's talking to. And I guarantee you, it'll keep a lot of confusion from you. And you will see that there are no contradictions in Scripture that way either. So it really opens it all up. We need to accept the full Word of God. We need the full re revelation. And that's what the Word of God gives us. And that's what Joel Paul was saying. They stop short. They're not, they don't have the full revelation of God and His program and what He has done through Messiah. They're, again, wanting to keep the parts they want. We want Messiah who's going to break the bondage that we're under. We want Messiah who's going to sit on David's throne, David's throne. We want the Messiah who's going to raise Israel up and bring her out of that suffering state that she's experienced at the hands of those who hate her. But they've got to realize the way to the throne comes through the suffering servant. He had to deal with sin first. Then he can deal with them as king, and he will. So, not knowing. Um, shall Paul testify and they have a zeal they, they care, they have a love for God but they don't have that knowledge verse 3 for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own ok here we go again they were seeking God in the external roles and they're missing him in the heart they're zealous for the form, the letter of the law they're missing the spirit of the law they're ignorant they don't know they have that zeal for Messiah, but they are opposed to the gospel. The gospel was done, what do I say? It, in God's honor, in maybe God's righteousness. I'm not sure what word I want, but the righteousness of faith is what's being brought out. They didn't know God's righteousness. So by, by not seeing, understanding, and accepting God's righteousness and His way to that righteousness, they're trying to do it on their own. And that's what he's bringing out here. They're trying to establish their own. They're going about seeking it. They want to be right with God. And this class is so timely because we're in 2021. We're in the days of awe, the 10 days of Teshuva, repentance between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah, the start of a new year. They want the slate wiped clean, but they believe God's opened two books, Book of Life, Book of Death. They've got to be written in that Book of Life if they're going to live another year. And the only way to get in that Book of Life is to be right before God. So they're trying so hard right now with all that zeal. Let me do everything right I can before my God and before my fellow man that I might earn favor with God, that he'll see my heart, he'll see my intent, and he'll accept me on that basis. But where do we ever read in Scripture that we can earn it, that we can merit it? What the law showed is nobody can reach the righteous standard of a holy God. Nobody. Can you keep that law entirely? From the Jewish perspective, 613 commandments. Even from the Gentile perspective of just 10 commandments, how many can keep all 10 and keep them every day of their lives? We know no one can do that. No one is born perfect and makes it all through this life perfect with the exception of Yeshua because he was supernaturally born, so he was God in flesh. But here they are establishing it on their own, trying to set it up on their own. This actually, whether they want to admit it or not, is pride. This is, I can do it. Remember I just quoted it a few minutes ago? I did it my way. Basically, that's what they're saying. They could make a monument to their own glory. I attained it. I reached it. I got it. In other religions, we hear they, they work for nirvana or something like this. They're all trying to get to that utopia state. But they're trying to do it in their own effort, in their own merit. And really, that is a self-righteousness. That is, at best, a legal righteousness. But even in the legality, they break their own law. They can't keep their own law. So he says that they, know about, that they don't know about God's righteousness. They seek their own. They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. If you have the word uh, submit instead of subject, good. It's the same idea. From the Greek, the background, what it really was, was a military word that meant to arrange under. 
It would have been soldiers, a part of a battalion with a commanding officer. They're coming under the authority of that commanding officer and they're going to move according to his word. If all of those soldiers decided to do it their way, can you imagine the slaughter of the company, the, the battalion? They have to move in cohesiveness following their leader and do what their leader says. That's what Paul is trying to show them. They've got to be obedient to, to God. They've got to be obedient to his way. And when he said the way to the Father is through the Son, when, when Yeshua himself says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, that gives no room for them to say, oh, I can build my own way. I can attain this. I can do this. The only way to righteousness is through God's faithfulness. We saw that again at the end of chapter 9, uh, verse 31. However, Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. They had the law. They knew what they had to do, but not one attained that righteous standard. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as they could by works. As soon as you're trying to do it by works, you fall short. You have to attain God's righteousness by faith. It is a faith walk. It is a belief in <coughs> God and His way and claiming His righteousness through our faith. By faith, we enter into that relationship with God. Yeshua closes us with His righteousness. I had just read recently, or, or heard actually, didn't read yet, I want to research it. Gideon, when he was fearful and God's calling him to a task, we see him go from a puny little scaredy cat to a mighty warrior for the Lord. And the scripture verse that, that was brought out that I want to follow through in the Hebrew, but I expect to find it there because they were saying they were bringing it up from the Hebrew, said basically that God clothed Gideon in his spirit. I see that slipping on of the spirit that brought Gideon into a different place. Now remember back in that day, the Holy Spirit would come on them for work and leave. The Holy Spirit did not indwell them as we are indwelt today. Today when we open our heart in faith, believing that in God and His way and not trying to merit ourselves, then we come in through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus and He puts His clothes, His robe of righteousness on us then we can come into the presence of our God and there's no reason to for him to ever say nope you didn't do enough you didn't do it the right way no as long as you come through his son the way he said by faith you receive it verse 4 for Messiah and that's the word that you need to substitute when you see Christ in your English it literally means for the anointed one, the anointed one of God, who we know is none other than Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. For the Messiah is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. What is that saying? He kept the law. He did it. He satisfied the law. He is the, the end of it. it. It's terminated with him. He's the one that came. He's the one that fulfilled it. He's the one that kept it. And he hit the goal, he hit the aim, whatever words I, I can use to make you understand clearly. He did it all, and now we come through him. He did it in our stead. The same way we as Jewish people believe we were in the loins of, of those that stood at Mount Sinai and heard that law, we stand in the loins of our Messiah who clothes us with his righteousness when we come into that faith. And he's going to take them all the way back to Moshe, verse 5. For Moshe writes of the righteousness that's based on the law, that the person who performs them will live by them. Let me take you very quickly to Leviticus 18 and verse 5 so you see what, what he's talking about. In Hebrew, that's Vayakra, Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 5. Leviticus 18, verse 5 says, So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments, God speaking, which if a person follows them, then he'll live by them. I am the Lord. It's not enough to just say it. They have to be doers, not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. They had to have that heart that sought after God to do, not just to hear. And if they kept them, if they lived righteously, if they lived legally righteously, they could make it. But God knew not one could. No one could. There's no one that does good. No, not one. 
All our righteousness is like filthy rags in the eyes of our God. This is Isaiah, his prophecies. Knowing of the impossibility of keeping the righteous law of God, he instituted the sacrificial system. He gave them the way to, to say, I'm putting faith in shed blood. This animal isn't perfect, but I will shed its blood in my place as a picture of the one coming who will shed his <coughs> perfect sinless blood in my place. So God established the law, but at the same moment of establishing the law, established the sacrificial system because he knew the law is to point them, be a schoolmaster, tutor them, show them you can't reach this level. And really, it's a lot of audacity, a lot of pride for anyone who says, I'm good enough, God should accept me. Wow. Really? Really? Yeah. A I'm holy, a person. I perfect go. I go. God. Yeah. And he should find you above all else on his level to accept you in. Wow. That really is, is a prideful <coughs> statement. We really think highly of ourselves. Yes, yes, and we're told in Scripture we're not to think highly of ourselves. So yes, you're right on target, Dora. But verse 5 is saying, So if you keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a person follows them and lives by them, I am the Lord. Knowing that's impossible, we again come back down to, to the reality we can't do it. Verse 6, None of you shall approach any blood relative of his to uncover nakedness. I am, you know what? I wondered how that got in there when I hadn't studied that. I need to get out of Leviticus and go back to Romans. <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> that was Leviticus 18.6, and it's talking about something totally different. So back to Romans, back to chapter 10, back to, I think I've done all of verse 5 there. Oh, that Messiah is the end of the law. He kept it. He kept it perfectly. If you put your faith in him, you've got it. You've made it. Not on your, your merits, on his what he has done. Verse 6, but the righteousness based on faith, okay, is of faith, it's based on faith, it comes out of faith. Uh, uh, I lost my place. The righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, or actually saying stop saying in your heart, don't think this way, that who will go up into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead? What's this referring to? Well, let's go back to the law that he's speaking to these people about. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, we're going to read very similarly. We'll probably take a shortcut through some of it. <coughs> Deuteronomy 30. When you're reading on your own, if I don't read all of it, you want to read verses 6 through 8 and verses 11 through 14 of Deuteronomy 30, 6 through 8 and 11 through 14. 6, moreover the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the hearts of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so you may live. You'll attain this level if your whole heart is, is circumcised by the Lord. The Lord your God will inflict the curses on your enemies and those who hate you. Verse 8, if you will again obey the Lord. Follow his commandments, which I'm commanding you this day. Drop down 11 for the commandment. This commandment, which I'm commanding you today, is not too difficult for you, nor is it far away. Does that sound like what we were reading in Romans? Yes. He goes on to say, it's not in heaven that you could say, who'll go up to heaven for us and get it for us, or proclaim it to us so that we may follow it, nor is it beyond the sea that you can say, who'll cross the sea and get it for us and proclaim it to us that we may follow it. On the contrary, the word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart, that you may follow it. Remember those words as we return to Romans. We're coming back to chapter 10, and we're coming to verse 6. And why the description here? What is he meaning by those words? Who will go up to heaven and bring it down? Well, is that not exactly what Yeshua, Messiah, did? Did he not come down from heaven to earth? That's talking about his incarnation, born in that womb by the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, so that he is sinless God in the womb of a child, uh, sorry, the womb of a human 
the child being born, the son being given, son of God being given. We see it very clearly. But that's what it's saying. Don't say, i got to go up to heaven and get it. God brought heaven down to earth for us. He was the incarnation. He is Emmanuel, God with us. That's what he's saying. And don't say that we've got to go down to the abyss and bring it up from the abyss. What's down in the abyss? The holding tank for the dead. Remember before Messiah had shed his blood and placed it on the heavenly um, mercy seat, they all went into the heart of the earth. Whether they went into a paradise side or a suffering side depended on their faith. If their faith was in the one who would come, Yeshua Jesus, they were in the paradise side. If their faith was in themselves, they were in the, the suffering side. But this going down to the abyss and bringing up is a picture of what Messiah did, that he was buried and rose from the dead so that he paid that penalty at the wages of sin is death. But he conquered death. He didn't stay dead. He didn't stay in the abyss. He came out of the abyss. He gives us that same abundant life. That's what's being given to us here very clearly. We see all the atoning work of the Lord doing the whole picture. He was born. He, he grew up. He died on the cross. He was buried. And he raised from the dead that we might have this saving faith. So basically that's what those words are saying. Let not the man who sighs for deliverance from his own sinfulness suppose that the accomplishment of some impossible task is required for him to enjoy the blessings of salvation. Don't say that, people. That's what Paul is saying. It's not too far away. It's not in the heavens. It's not under the earth in, in the, the, the deep. And he'll go on and say that in verse 7, in the abyss you might have in the deep. That's the bottomless um, common abode for the dead. Sha'ol, as we call it in the Hebrew. So Paul here is attesting to the fact he was incarnation and he was resurrected. These two show us he was God. Remember Nicodemus? No one could do the works you're doing if he hadn't come from heaven, if he hadn't come from God. He caught it. He got it. And, uh, and the fact of resurrection also. No one can resurrect themselves from the dead. Only God had the power of life and death and could bring back um, out of the dead. As, as literally it says just of Yeshua Jesus, he came out from among the dead ones. That's what it literally says for us. That's what verses uh, 6 and 7 are telling us. Verse 8, again, is going to sound like Deuteronomy, but what does it say? The word is near you. What does it say? What is when we're in faith, in faith righteousness? I'll put it that way. Verse 6 telling us righteousness is what we're speaking about. Remember that the righteousness based on faith speaks. What does it say? It says, verse 8, the word is near you. The message of salvation by faith is right here in your face. It's not out of reach. It's near you. If, it says, if your scripture says nine, that means near. It's in your mouth so that you can speak it. We're testifying of salvation right now by the words in our mouth. In your heart, it says also, it's in your heart. Meditating on it. You can meditate on this. You can speak it. You can hear it. You can meditate it. And also, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's in our heart is going to come out, the confession of our faith. When it's talking about the word here, it doesn't mean the word, as in, in the beginning, was the word. That's meaning in sentences. It's meaning you can use words. You can make sentences. You can speak it. You can explain it. It's that close. It's that tangible that we can share by our mouth what's in our heart. That's how close it is to you. It's not so far away that you can't reach it or can't attain it or can't understand it. And what is it? It is the message of faith. Um, and that's the rest of verse 8. That is the word of faith which we are <clears throat> preaching. What are we, we preaching? What are we telling? That you receive salvation by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. This is the faith message. This is the whole message. This is what brings them into that right standing with God. Verse 9, that on the basis of this, this word of faith that Shaul Paul is preaching that we also can preach today, that if you confess, you speak to it that you agree. I confess. I agree. I'm standing with Shaul Paul in these words. I'm confessing the Lord Jesus. I'm confessing Yeshua. 
as my Savior, as my Messiah. When you are in agreement with what the Scripture says, you confess it with your mouth. You, what are you confessing? Yeshua as Adonai. I want you to hear those words in the, the Hebrew because I'm going to bring out a meaning for you there. But just before I do, I'll leave you on that cliffhanger while I take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3 says, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Yeshua, Jesus, is accursed. And no one can say, Yeshua, Jesus, is Lord, is Adonai, except by the Holy Spirit. So how are we confessing? What are we confessing? We're confessing Yeshua is Adonai. Jesus is Lord. We're doing that by the power of the Spirit. Now with that in mind, back to Romans 10 and what we are reading there. When we are confessing the Lord, or, or um, Yeshua as the Lord, what we are implying is the deity of Yeshua Jesus. We are claiming that this one who took on human form, the name Yeshua here on earth, is at the very same time Adonai, the <clears throat> Lord God. Remember how I shared with you a little earlier, our Jewish people often will, as they're coming to faith, will come to a <clears throat> stage where they'll say, okay, Jesus was the Messiah, but they still will say, but he's not God, because they think that makes God too. And they think that Christians worship three gods. We worship a God called God, a God called Jesus, and a God called the Holy Spirit. They see them as three separate, which in a way is right. But it's also very wrong because we know that three is three in one. And that's why in the Hebrew it uses that word echad. Echad means one that can be divided. We have one egg with three parts. We have one God with three parts. We don't have three gods. We have one God. You cannot separate God, Yehovah, from Yeshua. You can't separate Yeshua from the Ruach HaKodesh. They all come together. You either believe in all three in one, or you don't believe in them as God at all. They are, even though I'm using plural, they are one. That's why it, our Hebrew in Genesis, in the beginning, God's created. Because God the Father, God the Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh, all three were involved in creation. And then it is a singular verb, as if only one is acting, because they're one in their action. They're one in their person. When you are saying, Jesus is Lord, you have now equated him with God. That is your way to salvation. Because if he's any less than God, he's only human. And if he's only human and you put your faith in any human, I don't care how good a life the human lives, you're going to fall short of that perfect holy standard. You're not going to get into heaven on the basis of anyone else's merits, let alone your own. You're not going to get into heaven on the basis of anyone else giving their life up for you to live. Does that happen? <coughs> yes, we have heroes every day. What I saw last night where two almost gave up their lives to pull an elderly couple out of a car on fire. All four survived miraculously, but the woman who was a nurse who was watching it happen said she thought she was going to see four corpses. She thought the two who ran the rescue were going to give their lives for those they were trying to save. Had they done it, I still call them heroes because they went to the danger to rescue, but had they given their lives, it would not change the status of any one of those four people where they ended up, whether they ended up in heaven or whether they end up in eternity apart from God. That's on the basis of what we do with the shed blood of Yeshua only. And that's what Paul's bringing all the way home. That, that the, when you call him Yeshua, when you're calling him Yahoshua from the Hebrew, you're saying Yehovah saves. God the Father saves <clears throat> through the Son that we call Yeshua Jesus. That shows heart belief in the way. Oh, is that why he called himself the way? Is that why the first followers of Yeshua initially were called of the way? Oh, they're of the way. Because it was the way to the Father. That's what he claimed. That's what he is. That's showing his deity. Now you are believing in God for your salvation. Not in human, in God. God who came in human form.
Yeshua Jesus. So, if you confess with your mouth that Yeshua is deity, he is very God himself as well as being human, if, a perfect human, and believe in your heart, okay? Head knowledge gets you nowhere. It puffs you up. It gives you accolades. You can hang all the degrees you want on the mm -hmm. wall and you can have every man say, wow, look at how smart he is. Yeah. Look at his education. And he's totally look at lost. who he is. Mm -hmm. And he can miss heaven by That's 18 right. <laughs> inches. You know what 18 inches is? The space between the head and the heart. If it's head knowledge only, it does you no good. It's just facts. It's not reality. It's not right. with the heart. But this says very clearly, with the heart, a person believes. So if you confess with your mouth, Yeshua as Lord, as Adonai, as God, as well as human, believe in your heart. Here's your faith. You are being guided to this by someone else, literally by the Holy Spirit. No one comes to the Father except the Holy Spirit. Draw them. You don't come to it out of your own conclusion. A, a baby isn't born and decides, oh, hey, I'm going to give my heart to the Lord because I've just got such a good heart. I've got it all together. No, they have to be taught from, from infancy. Wherever along the, the line it finally gets past the head and into the heart, they've entered into salvation. But you have to believe with your heart, which is guided by the testimony of the Spirit of God, who brings you into that righteousness with a uh, belief in your heart that God Elohim, God the Father, Jehovah God, raised him, raised Yeshua from the dead, you will be saved. Why do you have to believe he raised from the dead? Because if you don't believe that, you've got a dead God. You don't have one who paid and conquered the wage of sin. He died for our sins. He had to die. He didn't swoon. He didn't pull the wool over their eyes. He didn't lay in a clammy, a cool tomb that revived him and brought him back. And yeah, if he did, how did a weakened man, after all the beating and all he went through in crucifixion, how did he roll back the stone <clears throat> to show that the tomb was empty? How did he get out of there? I mean, it's so ridiculous. But anyway, not to get sidetracked, we are believing that results in righteousness. Faith is exercise. It results in righteousness. We don't ever become righteous because of what we do, but we receive righteousness because what we believe, our faith in our Lord, in our God, and it does result, hallelujah, in our salvation. Take it to the bank, okay? It's yours. You get to claim it when you believe in it with your whole heart and you believe in it that it's only possible because God, He Himself, did it for you, provided it for you. This is the saving of your soul. And I do not remember Matthew 12, 34, but I have that written down. Oh, okay. Yeshua is calling out the, the Pharisees. He calls them a brood or an offspring of vipers, snakes. How can you, being evil, express any good things? For the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. Remember, the heart has to be circumcised by God. We have to allow Him into our heart. Thereby, our faith comes, what comes out is the expression of our faith. Okay, so Romans 10, we are heavily with Paul on what salvation is and how important it is because even apart from the Jewish people that he's taking the task for not believing in their Messiah, who he's going to show them that, that's where they're missing it. Even apart from that, really is every person, every walk of life, anyone, any background that thinks that they can merit on their own, this is where it shuts it down. <clears throat> There's no room for any other way except by faith in Yeshua and in his work, what he has done. Um, for with the heart, I think I'm ready for that. Did I read that? I am in verse 11. Okay, uh, maybe I didn't read all 10. With the heart a person believes, that results in righteousness. With the mouth he confesses. The mouth tells what's already taken place in the heart. Mm -hmm. And when we believe with our heart conviction, then we are saved. Mm -hmm. Don't confuse it by saying, oh, you have to confess it with your mouth also, <clears throat> because then you would have to believe that someone on their deathbed could not be saved. But I fully believe, even on the deathbed, the thief on the cross, in those last moments of life, 
if they cry out to God for salvation, they mean it with their whole heart, that he will <coughs> receive them. He doesn't say, no, nope, you should have given me some of your life. You should have lived at least a week for me, an hour for me, a day for me. No, remember, he did it all. But no one bank on having that deathbed time because your life can be taken from you in an instant. You may not have a last moment opportunity, but for any who are around you in last moment opportunities, if you're visiting someone in a hospital, someone home on hospice, take that opportunity even if they seem to be in a coma-like state. It is believed that they hear they till do. the very end. Do. Don't miss the opportunity because in that coma state, and I know people have gotten saved in a coma and come out preaching, <laughs> That's right. give them the message. Give them that opportunity. Yes, Rowena? Oh. Keep trying. Keep trying. There you go. And could all, it could also mean that we could not be like a James Bond Secret Service believer. That's why we have to confess, you know. We're not believing and not declaring it. I'll tell you truthfully and honestly, and I, I believe I'm right, if you really have it in your heart, you can't help but confess it. That's right. It, you can't keep it to yourself. It, it will yes. come out. It will. You know, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And we do. God does want us to confess it. He wants us to share it. We're left here to tell. If we weren't, then let's get saved and get boot, beamed up. What do you call it? You know, beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> let's go home right away. Yeah. If we didn't need to be confessing it, if we didn't need to be sharing it. You can't so, contain yes. yourself. You, you really can't. When it's real, you can't. It, it really does bubble up inside of you mm -hmm. and comes out. And that fits with verse 11. The scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Remember, we talked earlier at the end of chapter 9, we talked about those who, who were stumbling over the rock. They were finding an offense. They were finding, you know, that it, it was shameful. No, the one that hang, hangs on a tree, which is the cross, is cursed by God. That's for shame. Well, that can't be our Messiah. Our Messiah can't die. Our Messiah would never die on the cross and get the, and be cursed by God. Our Messiah has to be king, has to, to, to break all that, that bondage. No, 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 no. Don't be ashamed of the cross. He was victor over the cross. And in that victory, we find that victory also. Let me um, remind you... Um, Yeshaya, Isaiah 28 and verse 16 was where it talked about the rock of offense, the rock that they were missing or stumbling over. Um, also, we saw at the end of chapter 9, verse 33, and I'm taking you real quickly to Isaiah 49 and verse 23. I don't think we did that last week, so I'm trying to give you a little different, you know, the references. Isaiah 49, verse 23, kings will be your guardians, princes your nurses, they will bow down to you with their faces to the ground and lick the dust from your feet, and you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hopefully wait for me will not be put to shame. Okay, what that's saying is that in time, Israel, yes, even the kings will be bowing down. All are going to bow down at the feet of Yeshua Jesus. Yes, Israel will be raised up to be that head nation as God has promised, but it's for those who, and that hope is the biblical hope. That's a sure hope. It's not, I hope it won't rain today. That's, I know, I've got my hope in my future because I know that my Messiah is coming for me. I know that I'm saved. I know that this will not put me to shame and I will not put the Lord to shame by denying who he is. That's what we're seeing in these verses. So, being ashamed is to be disappointed, to suffer repulse in life, to be disgraced, to be caused to blush out of shame, to be confused, to be frustrated, all of these are what's meant in this word. And it's saying when you believe in the Lord and in His atoning work, none of that is true. You are not put to shame, and we know that. We're valued in that. He found you worth His death and His resurrection to bring you into newness of life. You want to feel loved? Look at the cross. Amen. Look at the cross. Amen. No greater love has a man for another than that he laid down his life. I quoted it wrong, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, uh, verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. 
Show Paul now is being very clear. This message of salvation is for whosoever. It's not just for the Jews. It's not just for the Gentiles. There's no distinction. There's no drawing a, a line, dividing, distinguishing. And, and if you've got Greek there instead of Gentile, that's fine. Greek meant the heathen nations because all the other nations were considered heathen because only Israel was given the oracles of God, the very word of God. So what, what it's saying is Jew or Gentile, either one, um, there's no distinction. The same Lord, the same deity that we've been talking about, the same Adonai, the one who is fully God and who is fully human, this same Lord is Lord of all. He's Lord of the Jews. He's Lord of the Gentiles. And furthermore, he is abounding in riches for all who call upon him. He is constantly rich. He is constantly giving his riches. You know what we call it? Grace. 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 Rest. We are a grace. G-R-A-C-E. Oh. The grace of God. That's what is abundantly given to us by the Lord. He pours out grace upon us. Grace upon grace upon grace. That's why we even have that expression, there but for the grace of God go I. That's acknowledging if it were not for the Lord drawing us and doing it all for us, we would be in that lost condition. But he is he's rich. He, his grace is endless. He has abundant riches and he's constantly bestowing them on who? Us. Okay, us. The what word did it use in here? On all. Do you hear Jew in there? Do you hear Gentile in there? No. You hear all. That's why, yes, us. Personalize it. Beautiful, Dora. But I wanted you to see all. All. All, all, believers. all. All, all, believers. all believers. All who believe are abundantly in the riches of his grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a beautiful place to be. Verse 13, for everyone, <clears throat> excuse me, for every Jew? Oh, no, for every, every. Roman? Um, for every Greek? Gentile. For every Gentile? No, for every one. You ever met anybody who isn't an everyone? <laughs> I don't think we have. Everyone is someone, not necessarily anyone. How does that go? Never mind. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When you're calling on the name of the Lord, you are calling on the deity of the Lord God, and you're calling on Him, believing in Him for salvation. That's what it's meaning. Then it is for all and to all. In fact, verse 13 is a quote out of Joel 2, Yoel 2. 30 to 32, I'll take you there. And I want you to see that that time period that Joel is referring to, this is end times. And I don't mean our end times of the ecclesia, the called out assembly, the church age. I'm talking about the end of the tribulation. So it, it's saying it, it's good for them. What, what, what was that? Joel. Joel. Joel in Hebrew, Joel chapter 2, verses 30 to 32. I'll read them for you. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth. Blood, fire, calms the smoke. Sun will be turned to darkness, moon into blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will be about that everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. What time setting is that? When is the, the sun turned to, to darkness? When is there blood, fire, and calms the smoke in the sky? When does the moon turn to blood? That's tribulation times that's, that's revelation right. 6 to 19 uh, right. in those chapters that we know obviously that is end times and is saying that everyone who calls on the name of the lord will be saved how for on mount zion and in jerusalem there will be those who escape just as the lord has said even among the survivors whom the lord calls what that's saying is even in the tribulation period there is a remnant saved they're the ones who call on the name of the lord so this salvation in the name of the Lord is not good just in 2021. It is good in tribulation time. It was good in Shaul Paul's day, in early AD, the, the first, the first, um, oh, when was Rome, Romans written? Um, well, let me put it this way. Shaul Paul lost his life somewhere in the late 60s, so before 60, before 70 AD. 
Shaul Paul is quoting this. We know it's true for us today. This is the way of salvation no matter what time period you are on throughout history. This is the way to salvation. So he's bringing it to our Jewish people who know they're looking for that messianic age. He's saying, yes, there will be an end time. And we know following tribulation will be that messianic age. But salvation isn't just for them. Salvation is for now. Salvation is for today. If you will believe today, harden not your heart today, you will be saved. So what does it mean when it says whomever? It means Jew or Gentile. Every individual, whoever uh, yes. believes. But who has given their life to God? Yes. Well, who believes in the in, in the Tony work of the Lord for salvation. Yeah. Yes. But I mean, at the end, there's going to be a lot of them that are oh. going to be called. Okay, at the end, yes, there will be a lot who do. We know Joel also tied in with, with Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, that, that they will see him, they'll mourn for the, the one as they're the missing their only son, they'll realize he was Messiah. And Romans 11, 25 and 26, we'll get there. I don't think we have a chance to get there today, but we'll get there. Um, we see it talks about that the, the nation of Israel will be saved. Okay, so when it's talking about the nation, it's not talking about our individual salvation, but it is talking about the fact that God will not allow there to be a full end of the nation. He keeps that remnant. He keeps those who believe all the way through. So yes, there will be a time when we will see the nation finally turn to their God, finally cry out to their God, and, he, and they say, remember the phrase I've used many times, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When they say that, Yeshua says, I'm returning. In his return and they're seeing him, there are those who in the, those moments either already have believed or were, were seeking and searching and then seeing the reality in those moments are saying, yes, that is Messiah. He is our Savior. And the nation will be saved. The nation would have been annihilated if the Lord did not come back at the end at the Battle of Armageddon. Not just the nation, but it says the world, there'd be no flesh left alive. So yes, it is referring to a time when a, the nation will be saved. But when it's speaking of salvation of the heart, it has to be every individual person. They're not going to be saved just because they're in Israel. There will be those who will, will uh, we have the sheep and goats judgment right there at the end of the tribulation for who goes into the kingdom. Only the believers will go in. That means that there are unsaved that made it to the end of the tribulation, but their heart is not with the Lord and they are cast out. They will not go in and enter into the promised blessings for the nation of Israel. So you do, you, you have your two groups, sadly always, you have the smaller group of remnant believers, you have a larger group that will never confess Yeshua Jesus as Lord. They will bow the knee, but they won't have to do it because they believe in their heart. They will do it because they have to now. They're standing before him in judgment, and they have to acknowledge he is who he said he is. And it was his way, and I denied him. Sad. Sad, sad, sad. You don't think it would be a big remnant that goes in? A big remnant or not? Or will there always be a small one? I think it's small. <clears throat> It'll always I, be small. I think it's always small. I don't see the masses turning. I wish I could say it, but I don't see it. During the end times. Yeah. Yeah. So because so many have lost their be a their lot lives. of just a small remnant. I think so. I'd love to be wrong. <laughs> and I, you know, scripture doesn't tell us X amount will go in, so I don't know. Mm. I know 144,000 went to the ends of the earth with the gospel, and I know so many were saved but martyred for their faith by the time you get to the end of the tribulation i think it's a small number who made it alive physically but you have a large number who did receive the lord in those trying days of tribulation and they're under the throne crying out how long how long will it till you avenge our blood so that's a large number an innumerable number thankfully thankfully but the lord isn't willing that any perish he isn't willing that one be lost. Wow. Okay, so I did verse 11. Am I in? Yes, I'm in Romans. Okay, did I do? I've done, yeah, I'm way past 11, aren't I? 
Um, let me see if I gave you everything and it looks like I did. Joel referring to the end of the age. I think we're ready for verse 14. How then are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? Okay, this justifies the preaching of the gospel even to the Jews today. And here's another thing that I hear. Oh, the Jews aren't going to believe today. They won't believe till they're in the tribulation, so I'm not going to waste my time. Or some will say, well, there'll be a small number of Jews saved today, but it's not enough. I'd rather throw my, <clears throat> my fishing pole into where there's lots of fish and where lots are going to be saved. And there are more Gentiles getting saved today, just even by virtue of the fact there's more Gentiles on the face of this earth than there are Jews. But both of those statements come out of the pit of hell. Who doesn't want the Jewish people reached today? Satan. And that's it. He's the only one. The Lord doesn't say, well, I, I'm done with Israel until we get to the tribulation. I'm not going to save any till we get there. Hello? How did I get saved then? Because it's by God's work, not by anything I did. And I don't stand alone. There are many Jewish people still saved today. But sadly, many, and, and I hate to say it, but even in good churches who have budgets to reach the nations, do not have a budget to reach the Jewish nation. And they'll have one of two excuses. Uh, we don't know how to do that, which is not an excuse, because if you don't know something, learn. <laughs> Hello, how did you learn how to reach the Muslims? How did you learn how to reach any people group? You found out how to do it. You found out how to cross that bridge. Do that with the Jewish people too. It's not a foreign language. It's easier than to, to learn how to reach <laughs> A Jewish person, especially when it lives in America, then it, learning a foreign language and foreign ways and all the time it takes to prep to go to the, to, to the foreign mission field. So there goes that excuse. It is not a valid excuse that Jews won't turn today. There are Jewish people. God always keeps his remnant. And there's a purpose that we're going to be talking about heavily of how the Gentiles have a responsibility to the Jews that... The, the Jewish people stumbling was for their sake and in appreciation they ought to be taking it back to the Jewish people. So all of these are just lies that, that Satan uses to keep people from going to the Jewish people. And saying that, well, the nation won't turn until the end of the tribulation. Okay, but does that mean that individuals aren't saved till then? Of course not. Of course not. So you have no right to say, well, we'll, we'll take up witnessing to the Jew in the tribulation, or we'll leave it for those 144,000. Well, you know what? Those 144,000 aren't uh, aren't in their in their. They're not sealed from God today to do that job today. That will come in the future. I have to carefully say how I say because I believe they're alive and well. That's how close I believe the rapture is. Could I be wrong? Yes. If I'm wrong, that's okay. I would still rather be wrong in my zealousness to reach the world than to put something off that God doesn't want put off. Mm -hmm. But these are the lies that are there to not preach to the Jews, to not share to the Jews. And how will they come to salvation if someone isn't going, if someone isn't taking the word to them? How then are they to call on him in whom they've not believed? How is it possible that they, the Jewish people, will... will um, I gotta finish my sentence. How how will they, the Jewish people, call on him? They've got to hear. There's got to be a preacher. Isaiah says, "It's beautiful are the feet that shed the gospel of the good news." And it says, "How will they hear without a preacher? How will they believe if they cannot hear? How will they hear if there isn't a preacher?" Isaiah 52, if I remember right, I'm pretty sure I do. Uh, yeah, it's coming up. It's Isaiah 52, 7. <laughs> I think it is. I think it is, unless I've got the wrong scripture there. But anyway, on the basis of verse 14, we need to be out. We need to be sharing. We need to be telling. Remember, confessing with the mouth. How are they? How is Israel to call on him who they've not believed? How are they going to be told, hey, wait a minute, guys. You missed the Messiah. He has come. He is coming again to fulfill those prophecies, you think. But he's already come. If you get them to look honestly at their scriptures, they have to come to the point of saying either we have two different messiahs, a suffering messiah and a reigning, R-E-I-G-M, reigning messiah, or we have one messiah who comes twice. And of course, we know from the scriptures, there are not two. There is one messiah 
who comes twice. That's right. This is the word we need to get out. We need to be taking it out to them. How are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? How are they to hear without a preacher? There it is in verse 14. But we know this is a quote, and it's coming up, so I'll leave it in, in context. Verse 15, how are they to preach unless they are sent? Sent is the same word apostle, the, the, but it's in verb form, on a commission. They've got a job, and they need to be going and doing it. They're, they, it uh, I'm twisting my tongue. Okay, um, where am I? How, verse 15, how are they to preach unless they're sent? If God is sending them, they need to go. They need to take the word. God sends those to the Jews the same way he sends those to the Gentiles. He is not choosing one or the other. He is not setting aside the salvation of one for the other. Not before and not after. Even when he was working through the Jewish nation, it was for the Gentile also. They had to come into it through the Jewish laws. They had to proselyte to Judaism. They had to come into that, but there was a whole court for them called the court of the Gentiles. They were not excluded. They had to come. Rahab, Rahab, a harlot, says to, to Yeshua, to Joshua's uh, spies, when you come, when your God's going to conquer us, I know we're going to fall. I want to be saved. I believe in your God. I, we've heard of your God. That's quite a testimony. She had heard. And God brought her in, and she's even in the line to the Messiah. No one is shut out. Ruth is a Moabitess. She, ten generations of Moabites were cut off because of their sin. Eleventh generation, little Ruth, and here she's brought in. Lands in the, the field of Boaz, who is a picture of the Redeemer. God never shut out the Gentiles. They weren't not able to get saved until God, quote, set aside Israel, and now Gentiles get saved? No. He worked through the Jewish nation. When the Jewish nation as a whole rejected, then he said, okay, I'm going to give this to the Gentile to make you jealous. Oh, I just gave you what's coming in the chapter. Let's keep going, because <laughs> we'll get into that heavily in just a bit, and I'll get on my soapbox plenty then. So, They've got to have someone who goes, who is sent. And when they go and they're sent, what are they sent with? They're sent with the Word of God, not with themselves, not with anything they're saying. They shouldn't have their own words. It's the Word of God, and that's what's written here. Uh, justice is written. How beautiful are the feet of those who do what? Who speak about themselves, who speak about, you make it here, do it my way? No, they are the feet that are spreading the good news of good things, okay? What's that good news? What's good things? Do you think it's good news? You can be saved. You can have the, the way to live with God in his heaven forever. You can know for a fact that that's your eternal destination. Would that be good news? Mm -hmm. I think it's the greatest news. Mm -hmm. And here we are quoting Isaiah, Yeshua, chapter 52, just prior to the chapter so famously known of the suffering servant of Yeshua as the Lamb of God giving his life. 52 7 says, How delightful or how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of one who brings good news, who announces shalom, brings good news of happiness. What's peace? What's happiness? He says it. Who announces salvation? says to Zion, to Jerusalem, to Israel, your God reigns. Here's how you can know your God. That's the good news that, that's being told. They're going to shout with joy when they realize and they see the restoration of Israel. But then it goes on as you come down in, into, um, into chapter 53. It must be, is it 53.1? I thought it was the end of 52. Let me cheat and see if it's 53.1 that I want. Come on, tablet. Come on. There we go. It is 53.1. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And that's a whole other lesson in the arm of the Lord. But notice, who has believed our report? Is it Isaiah 2? Isaiah 53, verse 1. Right after 52, just following from 52 on. What does that mean, who has believed our report? 
a report. Oh, isn't that what the news media does to us every night? They report the news. They're supposed to tell us unbiasedly what's happened. Now, I'm not going to claim that. But here I'm going to say they're reporting. They're telling what's happened. They're telling the good news. How are they going to believe if we don't share the good news with them? How are the Jewish people going to get saved if you say, oh, that's for a later day? Please don't do that to my people. Have Sha'ol Paul's, Paul's heart for all of them to get saved. And trust me, this Jewish heart pleads for the salvation of the Gentile also. You're not left out. You're just as important and just as dear. Well, how long has have somebody been preaching to us? Yes. To reach us? Yes. Yes. For some, a long time. Mm -hmm. For others, they come quickly. Mm -hmm. For some, it's in the last moments of a long life. Don't ever judge that anyone's beyond salvation. God and God yeah. alone has that yeah. right to it's judge. judge. He knows when that heart is finally closed mm -hmm. and he gives them over to their own Their fruits, defeat. but not their destination. Right, <laughs> right, true. Okay, <coughs> Isaiah 52, 7 was talking about deliverance from Babylon also when you leave it in context that they would be delivered. They would come out of Babylon. We have Jeremiah also, who God tells him, buy a plot of land because the people are going to return. There was going to be 70 years of captivity. Daniel, Daniel, living at the end of that 70 years, begins to say to God, hey, God, we're at year 68. Shouldn't something start happening? We're at 69 now. We're almost to 70 years. Shouldn't there be a return starting because you've promised it? God promised them deliverance, but when we're talking about the whole picture of salvation, that's deliverance from our sin, that's deliverance throughout the corridors of time. Mm -hmm. That is timeless. Mm -hmm. Timeless. God's salvation is never put into a, a time when <coughs> someone cannot receive it. It's always there. Nahum also, Nahum 1.15 talked about deliverance from Assyria because the ten northern tribes went into Assyrian captivity. Then Babylon swallows up Assyria. So when Babylon swallows up the two southern tribes, now you've got all 12 tribes brought in together again under captivity and out of the 12 tribes, some from every tribe return. And isn't it amazing? Our God is so awesome. He has kept those 12 tribes distinguishable all the way down through time because in the tribulation, 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes are raised up to be the 144,000 that he sails. I just think that's amazing. All we know today for a fact is they're Levi or Cohen that came from the Levitical tribe. And DNA has found that chromosome <coughs> that makes them Levitical. I wonder if God's going to let DNA find any more so that they'll know what tribes they're from. <coughs> God knows, and that's all that matters. Yeah. And yeah. I guarantee you, that's he true. doesn't have 139,000 out of the tribe of Judah and 1,000 out of the tribe of Naphtali. No, it's 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes. He's kept his hand on the line the same way he kept that line all the way down to Messiah's birth. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it our God? You know, oh, I think I'll marry this one. <laughs> they have no idea, <laughs> but God's put it in their hearts. Name Cyrus 150 years before he's born. God knows it all. And you've got a question? Unmute. Got it. Is there any idea as to what the Gentiles will be doing while the 12,000 are working? Will we be supporting and helping? We're not going to just be off mute, are we? Okay. First of all, get your word we out of there. Be <laughs> you're not going to be there. <laughs> so True. you're gone. You're <laughs> okay? Yeah. You went up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> because the, the 144,000, and you, you meant that when you said 12,000, the 144,000 are raised up after the rapture during the tribulation period. They are not Jews that are saved that had to be left behind. Hello. Yeah. When we're called the body of Christ, mm -hmm. when God calls the body up, does he leave an arm down below? Does he leave a foot? Does he leave even a pinky dangling? No, the body goes. He raises up those who we may be laying down the groundwork for right now. If I'm at right with how close the rapture is, there are Jewish people hearing our preaching now. They're hearing our testimony.
They have not come to a point of rejection, but they've not come to a point of acceptance. Yeah. We suddenly disappear. Wow, they even talked about that. I think they might have had something. Mm -hmm. Let me get into their Bibles. Let me see what's said. However it's going to happen, God never leaves the earth without a testimony. The Holy Spirit takes us home safely, delivers us, our redemption sealed, and delivers us at the I'm not even going to say at the doorway of heaven. He escorts us all the way into the very presence of our God. But he will continue to work on the face of the earth the same way that he worked before this ecclesia, before this body, where he will come on people so that they work through the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish the task of preaching salvation and whatever else God has for them to do. The two witnesses are all in the power of the Holy Spirit. When their lives are taken, it's because their work was finished. They're going to lay dead in the street for three days. <laughs> I love it. The one time I wish I could see film at 11. Because can you imagine the fright on the faces of those people when they see those dead bodies suddenly brought back to life? Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit gives life. The Holy Spirit takes life. The Holy Spirit will restore their lives. They will be escorted up into heaven. And know mm -hmm. that is not a picture rapture to go up, right. not an yeah. innumerable number who are going up, who are meeting the Lord in the air, and the dead in Christ rising, and all the description of 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15 does not fit at that time. But the Holy Spirit will continue to work. So the Holy Spirit works on those hearts that heard the gospel, but hadn't believed it. Now the raptures happen, but they got saved. And now they say, okay, what do we do now, God? Well, what book do you think is going to jump off the page for them? <laughs> Revelation. They're going to know what's coming. They're going to know what they need to do. And if God commissions them and says, go with the gospel, they're going to go. They're going to witness. They're going to carry it to the ends of the earth. I think it's amazing that here you've got Jewish people all over the face of the earth. So who better to go to those Jewish people but then somebody who can go with their language? Because... <clears throat> let's just say I, I see Filipinas in front of me, okay? So let's say that, that they're speaking, and i got to say it right, Tagalog. Did I do it right? Did I do you guys justice? I hope so. Rowena, I don't know what you're saying. You're talking to me, but you're muted. Three. Yeah. She broke her arm in three places. <laughs> Can you unmute yourself? I'm dying to know what you're trying to convey. <laughs> I have something funny to share okay, when she on gets done. Yeah. Get that. There we go. Tell us what you're saying. I love your animation. <laughs> three syllables. <laughs> oh, three syllables. Tagalog. 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 Okay. Which way's right? Uh, that's right. Okay. I it said it right. It's a little bit slang, but it's okay. It could a be little bit slang. <laughs> Forgive me. Three. My heart intention is yeah. right. I love the people. You know that. My heart burdened for them because God took me on mission to the Philippines and I'm looking for missionary journey number two. I love them. But my point is, God's going to take them to the ends of the earth to reach the Jewish people. But what do you think's in that net when he's reaching those Jewish people? Do you think there's dear, beloved Gentiles living right next to them? Yes. Yes. God will bring salvation to the Gentiles also. Mm -hmm. They will be saved the same as they can be now. They'll be saved by accepting that. And will there be among them preachers and teachers also? I'm absolutely sure. It's just that we know the assignment of the 144,000 to go to the ends of the earth. So mm -hmm. that's why we talk about them because we're given that in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. We're given the detail because remember... In all honesty, everything relates to Israel in the Word of God, whether mm -hmm. you're in the original or whether you're in the Brit Hadashah, the new. It really is all about God in relation to Israel because Israel was to be his representative to the world. So there's your dear Gentiles. Yes, many, many, many Gentiles will be saved. Many Gentiles, just like happened in the Holocaust, will give their lives to, to hide a Jewish believer to hide one of the preachers, to hide, you know, one that's being hunted down because the Antichrist is going to go after the Jews and he's going to go after the Christians. And there will be many who will be losing their lives because they took a stand. 
So mm -hmm. yes, many Gentiles active and involved and carrying it out also. We're just told in relation to Israel, in relation to the Jewish people, about the assignment of the 144,000. Okay? All right. I just Pam, have something funny. And then Dora, I'm right to you. I have something funny to yeah. share. I don't listen to the end of the age only because of the news. Well, I had overheard him say, he says, the two witnesses are going to be mortal, and I can't wait to meet them, and I'm going to invite them on my show. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking, you know, there were, during the tribulation, there is not going to be any any Christian ministry, because the Antichrist <coughs> will put an end to that. <laughs> so here he is, he can't wait to meet them and have them on his show. <laughs> Well, but, but, but if he's a future believer, he won't be here anyway. No, no but, but, he's, but, sadly, but he's post rap. He believes yeah. in post. And as long as he's saved, he'll just That's be surprised what I to find for the out news. that if he's not genuinely saved, mm -hmm. then he may find himself. Oh, yeah. I hope for his sake he's genuinely <laughs> saved. Okay, Dora. Okay, my question is, the two witnesses, yeah. are they all of a sudden going to appear and be witnessing mm -hmm. to people? Mm -hmm. And when they come back to life? How long are they going to be? Like, they do, in, in my estimation, they are suddenly on the scene. They're not going to be born and grow up like, yeah, you know, yeah. no, I they're, they're suddenly, that. I believe that they are two that are sent from God mm -hmm. for Me a too. purpose. Yeah. Yeah. We may disagree a little on who the two are. Yeah. We'll find out who's no, right I think now. they'll come from heaven, yeah. Uh, yeah, but absolutely come from heaven. So they are suddenly on the scene. They are power. Power, what do you call it? Power Powerhouse. Powerhouse, yes. Yeah. Thank you, all of you. Yeah. They're going to be so endued by the Holy Spirit. They're mm -hmm. going to be doing an amazing work. And they're going to be absolutely hated by the Antichrist, by Satan, who's empowering the Antichrist, because they're taking such a bold stand, mm -hmm. and they're in the face of the Antichrist doing their work. When their work's completed, when they've done their testimony that they've been sent to do, and I believe that it, it's, I, I got I'm trying to remember. Um, I, it's very close to the middle of the the tribulation when they will be taken back up into yeah, heaven. I so I believe their work at the most let's just say approximately three years at the most, mm -hmm. because they're they're going to come after the rapture. They're going to come during the tribulation period. How close to the beginning, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But by about the mid, they've been taken yeah, back up into heaven. The so yeah. they're going to work for about three, three years, three and a half years at the very, mm -hmm. very most, uh -huh. and maybe a lot less. You know, I don't. God doesn't say when He sends them. Just in that first part, mm -hmm. they've done their work. They they've completed their work, and so God allows at that point He allows their lives, their physical lives that that they have manifested because they're not down here looking like ghosts. They're down here looking yeah. like human right. beings. Mm -hmm. So that, that human flesh that he has clothed them with again is going to die. They're going to be... Prior to that, they could I'm sorry? Prior to that, they could, that they could not. They could not be put to death do. early. The Holy Spirit yeah. is the one, again, gives and takes life. They're protected. They can be mm -hmm. like Superman with no kryptonite, okay? Yeah. And they do their, their duty, but now their job is done. And as a testimony, God's going to allow them to be put to death. The Antichrist is, is like Scrooge dancing on the grave, you know, on the coffin. They're going to think, you know, they're, they're going to be giving gifts and celebrating and looking, you know, we, we did it. We, we're the victors for three days, probably three and a half days. And they lie in the street for that long. Uh, yes, they'll lie in the streets of Jerusalem. They work out of Jerusalem. Their work goes however far God lets it reach, but they're working in Jerusalem. They're, they're put to death in Jerusalem on the streets. Mm -hmm. they're, they're gunned down or sorted or whatever. And, and the media is going to be all over it. The media is going to be all over all of these happenings. But that's why I'm saying I can just see them standing there on that third day, mm -hmm. still talking about these dead bodies that are there, still rejoicing and thinking that, that it's the greatest, when suddenly the Spirit of God is going to breathe life back into them. They're going to stand up on their feet and they're going to be taken up into heaven, and they're going to see them go. Oh, see, the rapture, they don't see us go. They wonder what happened. But here, these two, they're going to see them go. If that isn't a testimony so of the power of God, ascended, just, like they Jesus will, was just, ascended. just like Jesus ascended, mm -hmm. if that does not say to those who are seeing it, this is power that's not human. This is powerful. This, yeah, I want to get right with that God. 
awful fast. Mm -hmm. So it is for a test money. Sadly, they'll find their, their reason not to. Oh, this is the rapture, though. This is not them. But oh. this, this is um, in the twinkling of an eye. And if you can see it, and I don't know that you can, oh, I'll bring it up close for the camera. What you're seeing is like they got taken right up out of their shoes. <laughs> Whoosh. Wow. You see uh, the, the socks, you know, whatever oh, you want to oh, call I see. it. <laughs> yeah. So, one of my mom's favorite mugs. <laughs> so, so. Some pe preachers are teaching that the, the rapture will take place in the Feast of Trumpets. Well, we're, what do you, we're what coming do you think? In, I don't think it has to be. It could be. But I don't believe it has to be on that day, and that day ends at sundown. So I'm very glad that I can believe tomorrow, if it hasn't happened by sundown tonight, we could still be raptured. I don't have to wait a year for another day. When they say no man knows the day and the hour, and so they bring it in, and they say we can know that it's on this feast, that's talking second coming. That's not talking rapture. That's oh. why not the second coming. So They're the Feast of Trumpets couples. is in the second coming, but the, not the rapture. The Feast of Trumpets could be represented they can't, it, God could use it and put the rapture there, but there's nothing in scripture that it has to be. Oh. You know, they're the ones that they're, they're so there's saying. there's a possibility of it. The surest possibility. Oh, there's okay. a possibility the Lord could come today. We're on Feast of Trumpets well, right now. True. I should be blowing my shofar for you. Come anytime, yeah. If you want it at the end, yeah. I'll blow my shofar at the end for you. But we're trying to wind up because I know we're at 335. Obviously, we're not even going to finish chapter 10. <laughs> <by amazing. laughs> but again, we're, we don't want to rush what the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. I know Anne's up there dying to get either a question or a comment in. And Rowena, you're right behind Anne, but Anne beat you. So uh, I think I've said everything I need to say while I'm thinking. Go ahead, Anne. Did you get to share? Go ahead, Anne. Uh, this Anne? Me? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Did I misread you? I, no, honey, you answered my question. I My question That's was right. Gentile involvement with That's right. the... That's right. the and I, and I forgot, I was so intent on not overlooking you, I went back to you. Okay, Rowena, can you come back? <laughs> I know okay. you've got things. Okay, um, because when I was in a, in a religion still, I did not know anything about this rapture or whatever. And um, just last Sunday, I got shocked because a sister in Christ said she does not believe in the rapture. I, I did not anymore prolong our conversation because I didn't want us to have an argument. And she was saying the rapture was just something that the evangelicals just started to teach like uh, several years ago, or I, I don't know how many was well, several years ago. But in my heart, I was saying, well, St. Paul was teaching it 2,000 years ago to the Thessalonians, but, but yes, ha, ha, is that? Is that true, what she was saying? No, it is not About true. The, the word rapture comes out of the 15th century. So it's a recent word. It's the Latin word rapturo. I don't care if you throw that word out. That's fine. <coughs> Let's call it what the scripture calls it, the great snatching away, That's the catching it, up. Call it, away. Call it yeah. whatever name you yeah. want. It not, we it are not looking thing. for the word rapture in scripture any more than I'm looking for the word trinity yeah, in scripture. Right. And yet I know my God is a triune God. Really he is right. a trinity. The teaching has continued through the ages. Paul thought the rapture would happen in his day. He says when we who are alive and remain will be caught up. He doesn't say when you. He thought it would happen in his day. If it could have happened in Paul's day, why do we not believe it's always been able to happen since that day forward? Where do we read that, oh, this can't happen till a certain time? The only criteria for the rapture is that the body of Messiah is completed. The body of Christ is completed. That's why we say when that last one who's going to be saved as part of the body of Christ, the ecclesia, is saved, then we get to go home. So hurry up and evangelize so we can get to who that last person is. Because as my mom would say, it's too bad God didn't, didn't paint a stripe down their backs. And we could go around lifting the shirt and say, oh, you're one who's going to get saved. Let me preach to you. We don't know who's going to be in that number. So we, we continue to be faithful to give the word out. When that number is full, is complete, then the Lord says, come up home. Come, come up. That's the words we're listening heaven. for. I mm -hmm. thought that was supposed to be, uh, we still need another um, thing to happen. For the rapture? No. Yeah. No, for just for the last one to get saved who's a part of that body of Christ. That's it. No other event on the calendar. 
has that's, to that's happen the next event. for the rapture. The next, <laughs> that's event, the next event is a rapture. That's why it could happen today. Because right. that last one could get that's saved. Right. There could be somebody in Timbuktu who's praying the sinner's prayer right now with the one who is leading them to yes, the Lord. Be. And that could be the last one. And the Lord says, you know what? Come on. Come on. We don't know who, how soon. We can't put a time on it. God doesn't allow That's us right. to put a time on it. Mm -hmm. But he tells us it's imminent. He tells us it can happen at any time. Mm -hmm. So the teaching yeah. is all the way through. Rowena, I hope you're here, and I know you've got things going on in your family, but there are in the 300s, I think it was in the 400s, I think it's Ignatius, and, and then I want to say Augustine. Don't quote me on these names, but there are church fathers who carried that, that belief forward. It wasn't just Paul, but I'll take it from just Paul anyway because this is the word of God that's inerrant. This is where we get it, not because of what somebody says, not because of a name put on it, but for those who stayed with the word of God, the teaching has always been a lie. It is not recent. They try to say that it came out with Darby, with Schofield notes. No, it didn't. In fact, you can... Uh, there's there's an article against what they're saying where the, they misquote Darby and they misquote what is being said. But they use that to try to say, oh, it's only because of them that we have this teaching today. No, it's only because the Latin came around being a popular language for the world that we got the word rapture out of raptura. That's the only thing that, that's recent, not the teaching. The teaching goes all the way back, has continued. God has always kept those who are faithfully looking for him. What is the blessed hope that Titus refers to if it is not continual? Titus said that, that you're even given a reward for those who look for his coming. Well, that's not meaning in second coming. I'm not looking for his coming in second coming. I'm coming with him. So I don't need to look for him. I'm going to line up right behind him. And I'm coming with it. <laughs> and that's going to be a great day also. But I am looking for his coming. I am looking for it to happen today. If I'm disappointed today, that's because my timing is in God's timing. And I have to say, okay, Lord, let me be patient a little bit longer because I want that one more saved. I want that one more to be a part of our family. If you're burdened for anybody for salvation right now, that's the only thing that can dampen your enthusiasm for the rapture, in my opinion, and still be right spiritually. Because you're saying, I really want you to come, Lord. I'm so looking forward to it. But yeah, okay, wait a little longer if it means this one will get saved. If it gives this one time to get saved. That's the only thing that we're waiting on. And it is not a 20th century teaching, an 18th century teaching, a 15th century teaching. It is a first century revelation given to Shaul Paul. And if you want to throw out what Paul says, then throw out everything. Because again, like I said early on, I either believe it all or I believe in none of it. Well, I happen to believe it all. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and righteousness. That's the word of God. So I love to call it the great catching away, the great yes. departure, nice the snatching word. away. That's He's right. going to snatch us up. And it's going to be fast and sudden. And if our bodies weren't changed on the way up, we'd disintegrate. And if they didn't change before we were in heaven, we'd explode all over heaven because we can't contain the glory of our Lord whose presence we're going to have. Yes? So off the top of your head, where can we find the rapture on, on the, or catching up? Bible. In the Bible, it's, it's, in it's 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians 4. Verses 13 to 18, which, by the way, 18 says, comfort each other with these words. That's right. It's not a comfort if it's... If you're going through if, the tribulation. Yeah, if it's put off like and sure you've got to suffer week, first yeah. and, and all of that, there's no comfort. There's no comfort If you're... Dosi's bearing a niece. Her heart hurts. She's going to miss her niece. Those are people who live even closer, a husband or, or you know, somebody in the same home. You, they, they were grieving because they're, they're standing at the graveside. That's where I picture Paul saying those words. At an open grave, a fresh grave that's just been dead, and that one's standing there crying. And he's not saying to them, well, way down the line, after this, da, 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 then you can, you can look for this to happen. He says, you know what? This could happen today. 
that the Lord's going to come out of heaven with the shofar blast. He's going to blast. He's going to call up, come up hither. The dead's going to come up first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up with the Lord, and so shall we evermore be with the Lord. Hallelujah. No returns. One-way ticket, people. Um, so to, to answer your question, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. 1 Corinthians 15. 51 to 54, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54, it talks about how we're all changed in a twinkling, in a moment, you know, faster than the twinkling of the eye. The immortal, I mean, the mortal puts on immortality, and it goes on and says it in another way also. So those, that's also telling us because it's that rapture that we're suddenly changed. At that second coming, we don't read about those people that are saved getting a changed body. They go into the millennium in their mortal body. So those verses of putting on immortality have to be talking about rapture. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah. Then when we go into 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians is assuring them they've not missed the rapture and found themselves in the tribulation. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And you have to read it through. What was First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians four, four. is a rapture. Okay, is a rapture. Now, Paul's written a letter. Remember again, take out verses and chapters. Paul wrote to a people called Thessalonians because they lived in Thessaloniki, so they're called Thessalonians. He's written them. He's told them about the rapture. It's almost the last thing that he tells them in his letter. He ties up his letter, greeting some people, and he signs his name, and it goes. In between 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, somebody, a little time goes, and somebody sends them a, a letter, signs Paul's name to it, and basically oh, says, you guys blew it. You have missed the rapture. You are in the tribulation. You better get your act together now. It shook them to death. Yeah. It scared them, the living daylights out of them. Faked his name. Paul gets this information, and he says, whoa, 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 whoa. If an angel... If anyone from anywhere preaches another gospel to you, if they sign my name to it, mm -hmm. don't believe it. This is not what I said. I told Amen. you about the rapture at the end of my letter to you. Right. I'm picking up and sending you a second letter. So I'm not going to spell it out in that detail again and say, here's what happens in the rapture. I'm going to take it for granted. You've got that letter. You know what happens in the rapture. And now I'm going to tell you, hey, that doesn't happen before, I mean, that happens first, and then these things happen, so that you can know you haven't missed it because these things haven't happened. What has to happen? The man of sin has to be revealed. That's and right. he can't be revealed till the Holy Spirit, who's holding him back in that evil back, is taken out of the way. Well, how's the Holy Spirit come out of the way for the Antichrist to do his work? Because he takes us home in rapture. And then he comes and works in a different form on the people, as we've already talked about. So 2 Thessalonians, starting with chapter 2 in particular, because 1 again is the opening and all of that, again is reassuring them they have not missed the rapture. They're not in the tribulation. And then really, it, it, when you look with the open eye, First Thess uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, talks about that we're not appointed to the wrath. And it's very clear it's not talking about salvation so if it's talking about we're not appointed to wrath and it's not god's wrath against those who aren't saved what other wrath is there yeah. only the tribulation that's right. we're not appointed because it to says the tribulation. it'll come upon the whole world yes. so it's definitely talking about the tribulation right right that's first thessalonians a second thessalonians sorry chapter one really you there are verses in almost every single chapter in the thessalonian books chapter that refer one, verse to 10? yeah of uh, second thessalonians Okay, that we're not appointed to wrath. Um, and it's not talking about salvation. So it's telling us we're not appointed to the tribulation, which means there's a rapture before the tribulation. Then you can take it to Revelation 3.10. The church of Philadelphia is promised to be kept away from the edge of. They don't go in and come out. They're kept away from the edge of what comes on the face of the whole world, like Pam just said. So we know it's tribulation because the whole world will be suffering it. And it's for those who are not, the, the ones who escape it are not earth dwellers. How do we know we're not earth dwellers? Where's our citizenship? In heaven. heaven. We are ambassadors here, sent, apostles, sent. We're on commission. We're on duty.
to spread the message that our citizenship is heaven. We are heaven dwellers. We're not getting to live it at home until our assignment's done. But when your assignment's done, that's where you go, whether it's individual or whether it's everybody at the rapture who is taken back, taken up to home at that time. We're so already Revelation, his, so why do we have to go through the tribulation? We already belong to him. Right, Those are just right. the ones that are lost and get in during the tribulation right. time. To are your martyrs them to that their make meat. it in? Yes. Yeah, but yes. we're already his. Right. Right. And, uh, we don't and have Revelation 310 is the Church of Philadelphia, which is today. We know the Church of Philadelphia is the on fire Bible believing, Bible teaching church. They're the ones promised to escape. Notice Laodicea, which is at this time also, but thinks they're right with God, thinks they're clothed in, in the robe of righteousness, and they're naked, thinks their eyes are open to the truth, and they're blind. They are not promised escape from the tribulation. That's how people say, oh, but there's the church in the tribulation. Well, there's the church of the unsaved that's in the tribulation. There's not the church of the saved, not yeah. the church of the believers. Mm -hmm. So those are just off the top of my head. I'm sure I could come up with some more verses for you, but that's First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, almost every chapter in the Thessalonians, that is First Corinthians, and that is Revelation. So is that enough for right now? Yeah, that's good. Okay, only because I looked at the clock. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if I think of any others, I'll bring them out to you next time, too. And anyone who is in the hearing right now, if you're wanting a refresher course, if you're wanting where I go into the, the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, if you're wanting those kind of teachings, I have them on CDs. If you let me know, I can make them available. Maybe we can also work to get them uploaded, Roger. Um, it might take us a little bit of time. This poor guy is overwhelmed trying to get all my stuff up for the Holy Days. I shouldn't call it stuff. All, all the teachings for the Holy Days. So, um, but I'll try to get it up soon too. Uh, but if you're, if you're scared at all, the Lord is not the author of fear. He gives us shalom. He gives us a sound mind. We have nothing to fear. And they'll say, oh yeah, that's because if we can be in the tribulation and it, can't, it won't touch us. True, that can happen. But we read mostly in the tribulation, it will touch them. They will be martyred for their faith. They will be hunted down. They will be put to death. Yeah. Does that mean every single one? No, because we know that there are some saved to go into it's the millennium. Extra. So there are some that get saved and manage to live through it. But it's not, even the first half is no pigment. Those who say, oh, the first half isn't so bad. If I have to get caught in that, it's okay. <laughs> They'll read Revelation 6. Go read the start of it. You want to live through that? I don't. Death, nope. war, famine, pestilence That's in right. the beginning, <laughs> yeah. in the first half. It's easy no. now. It's going to be hard. This it's is easy now yeah, to get in. To that. Look at our pandemic and look at how this world has come apart at the pandemic. That's right. Hello. This is just a simple wake-up call. There's something worse coming. Just Get right the with stage. the Lord that you might escape yeah, it. Yeah. And don't put your your trust in anything of man's. Okay? I'm not going to finish no. that sentence because I'll send this off in another. But you all know where to fill in the blanks. Yes, Roger. Uh, one thing that goes with you would have to really worry about is if you're walking with someone you know as a Christian, and all of a sudden... They're gone. You're still walking. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't hear Rob, that's he says, that's you can fear freaky. if you think you're a Christian and you're walking with someone who is a Christian and they disappear on you. <laughs> you can fear. But having said that, let me point out once again, Matthew 24, two in the field, one taken, two in bed, one taken, is not, and I repeat, not the rapture. That is not talking about the rapture. About that is talking about at the second coming, they are taken away in judgment. The ones left are the ones okay because they're going to go into the millennial kingdom. Not rapture there. Don't go suddenly put the rapture at that point because then your rapture is post-tribulation. It's at the end. It's not even in the middle. Yeah. And those who put it in the middle, not only do you not see it with the two witnesses that I told you go up that the whole world sees that happen and nothing said about others gathered with them, but also when God speaks to Israel who goes through the tribulation, they go into it, they come out of it. Israel a whole as a nation. When God is speaking to them, Isaiah 26, he tells them, when you see, when you're dealing with the indignation, the wrath of God, 
when you see, and it, well, Daniel says, when you see the abomination set up, that's when you're to flee. We know that's the midpoint. In Isaiah 26, it's talking about when that indignation is going to last a little longer, and indignation is the wrath of God, the tribulation is his wrath poured out. Isaiah is saying when it's going to last a little longer, which is at that midpoint, Isaiah doesn't say, look up, here's the rapture. Isaiah tells them, flee, hide, uh, hide you yourself for a little while. Why do they need to hide if the Lord's coming back for That's them? Right. The Lord would uh, say, hey, at that moment, don't panic, don't fear, look up, here I am, I'll, I'll pull you up out of it. But he doesn't That's say right. that. He says, hide yourself for a little while till the indignation is completed. That's Isaiah 26, 20. Uh-oh, that sounds wrong. Let me grab my Bible. Now, is that middle uh, term? That's middle. <coughs> yes, that's term. a middle term. When he and says flee. Uh, yes, oh, yes. Yeah. Daniel 9 has it. Matthew 24 has it. They all talk the same talk. Matthew 24, 15, it says, when you see the abomination desolation set up in the temple, flee. We know that's the midpoint. That's why verses that come later, which people take and say are the rapture, no, that's your second coming, where, where it says two are in the field, one is taken, and one's, uh, one's left. And it says they're taken the way they were taken in the days of Noah. How did they go in the days of Noah? They went in judgment. They were taken away in the flood. They were taken away in judgment. And it is Isaiah 26, 20. I was quoting right. Can my people, my people being Israel, because we don't have the church in Isaiah's day, can my people Israel enter into your chambers, shut the doors behind you, hide yourself as it were for a little moment until the indignation, until the wrath, is past. That's why I can't do a mid uh, trip rapture because he doesn't say look up, he says hide. Okay, they need to hide for about three and a half years. If they're fortunate to hide for three and a half years, they'll be alive in the return of the Lord, second coming, where Matthew 24, I think it starts about verse 40, might be 42 where it's saying that two are in the field. And one's taken, two are in bed, and one's taken. Matthew 24, you so don't find the rapture in Matthew. Mid. That takes care of your mid, he can't come midway. Right, right, absolutely. Because that scripture says flee. Exactly, flee and hide, yeah. not, not look at. Um, okay. The verse, no man knows the day and the hour. Remember again, this is talking about second coming. That's 2436 of Matthew. 37, as the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In his second coming, when he's returning, is what it's talking about. It'll be evil all over the face of this earth. It's so bad that if he didn't come, there'd be no flesh left alive. For as, verse 38, as it was in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and, and giving a marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Notice the language. The flood came and took them away. Did they survive the flood? Did it take them floating off? No. And they, they were <laughs> off in paradise, you know, drinking their little drinks, sitting on the sand, enjoying the sun? No, their lives were taken from them. They lost their life. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two shall be in the field. Verse 40, one shall be taken and the other left. One's taken away in judgment, the other's left to go into the kingdom. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord does come. If you'd known, you would have been prepared. Why do they not know? Because even though they know it's tribulation is a seven year period, God says in his mercy the days are shortened. He's coming back because if he didn't, there'd be no flesh left alive. So they can't go from the day of the rapture and count exactly seven years and say, this is the day of the Lord's return but they can get pretty close. They can know. If they're realizing early on, I better pack up food for six years, five yeah. years, whatever. I better go find my hiding place now. They can begin to know and get close, but they will not know exactly. When the Son of Man returns in his glory and sets up his kingdom, which if you keep reading and you read in order, Matthew 25 takes you into who goes into the kingdom. It doesn't take you into who goes into heaven. It doesn't take you to the Bema seat for reward. It doesn't take you to any of that. It takes you to an earthly throne set up 
in Jerusalem with Messiah sitting on it. And who's going to be in there? The parable of the ten virgins. There are those who thought they had it all. They were right. But they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the oil. They didn't have the light. They're going to be outside of that kingdom knock and wanting in. But they're going to be told, depart. I never knew you. We have the, the parable of the talents. The one that, that hid the talent. That was given the truth but did nothing with it. Didn't get it from head to heart took and buried in the ground what he had and said, you're mean, Lord. I, I was afraid of you. I was afraid if I lost what you gave me, I could never, you know, I, I couldn't appease you. So here, I'm at least giving you back what you gave me. And God's not finding him faithful because he didn't have faith. There was no faith. He will not go into the kingdom, but the ones who had faith, the ones who doubled what God gave them, he tells them, come into my kingdom. I'm going to make you who had ten talents you're going to be over 10 cities. You who I gave five talents to, you're going to be over five cities. He's assigning them positions, ruling with him in the second coming. There's no room for rapture there. This is not rapture yeah. talk. And remember, Matthew is written to a Jewish audience. It's written to those who have been told Messiah is going to come and set up the kingdom. The, the Talmudic, in the, what started this? Chapter 24, the first verses, what started this whole discourse, Lord, you're talking about this temple being destroyed. We're not looking for the destruction of the temple. We're looking for you to set up your, your kingdom. When, when will that be? When will be your kingdom? When will be the end of the age? When will Messiah sit on the throne? They're asking three very Jewish questions. They didn't know about the church because it wasn't even birthed yet. They're not asking, when are you going to come rapture us, Lord? They have no clue of that kind of talk. They're saying, when's that promised millennial age? When are you, Messiah, going to be king? When are you going to sit on the throne? When are we going to rule and reign with you? When is Israel going to be broken out from under the bondage of Rome? Because that's who was on top of them, controlling them at this time. That's what they were asking. And Yeshua didn't deviate and say, well, let me tell you, let me tell you, I've got this body of people, and I'm going to talk to, to, to you about them, and, and they're going to go in rapture. What would that mean to these men? Nothing. But God's promising them that kingdom. And when you study the book of Acts, which is the transition, you see in the first seven chapters, the kingdom is still being offered. If they would have accepted that he was Messiah, the, the, he would have returned them. We know God knew they wouldn't. He had the eternal plan, the plan to bring in the Gentiles. We're going to get to that next week, I hope. But God knew that. It wasn't, oh, i got to come up with plan B. No, he knew that. But in the beginning, he, he's still offering the kingdom to them, and they're still rejecting it. Finally, they beat the apostles, and the ultimate is when they finally martyr Stephen. And Stephen sees heaven opened up, and he sees the Lord standing. And people say, isn't that beautiful? The Lord stood up to receive Stephen. Well, sorry folks, I'm going to ruin your pretty picture. Yes, the Lord welcomed Stephen into heaven, but he was still standing. He had not yet sat because the kingdom was still being offered. If they would have accepted the kingdom, he would have, which means that he was Messiah, he would have returned to them and set up his kingdom on earth. When they finally martyr Stephen, their first martyr, that's when God says, okay, Israel, you, I get it. You're not going to turn. Well, he knew. He doesn't get it. He knew. But you're not going to turn your hearts. You as a nation are not going to receive the Messiah. So he, t in essence, tells us that, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And the rest of the plan goes on, and we are introduced to Shaul Paul, to his salvation, to him being raised up, and given personally, and he's the only one allowed to say this because it's an inherent word of God, that God took him on the backside of the desert, taught him, him himself. He taught him fresh and anew because the rapture wasn't in these scriptures. The, the church letters weren't in the Jewish scriptures. So God raised up Paul to be an apostle to who? To the Gentiles. The Gentiles. To bring to them all this truth that they had no knowledge of. And that's why God also gave him the rapture, because it was talk for the church, talk for this age. The, the Jewish people, Israel, had they known about this age, they could have said the Messiah 
you, you can't offer us a kingdom. This has to happen first, and this has to happen, and this has to happen. They couldn't see that. What they did is they looked. When you look at a mountain in the distance, you think it's one mountain, but it can be two mountains. You know that when you start driving and you see it actually separates? There's even a, two trees on a property here in San Bernardino. In the fall, they are gorgeous. They're in the front yard, and as you're approaching that house, you would swear it is one large tree. But when you drive up to the house, you find out it was two trees, and there's a little distance in between. Those two mountains have a distance in between. That in between is the church age, ending in rapture. But they're looking at the first coming and the second coming at such a distance that they look like they're one event. They don't realize they're two. God raises up Paul to bring us what happens between the two events, between the first coming and the second coming. And he gives us 13 letters. 14, because I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. 14 letters written to give us understanding and direction during this time. In all honesty, during the tribulation, 1 Thessalonians 4 is not going to mean anything to those people. Remember, all scripture for us, but not all to us. All they could do in the tribulation when they read 1 Thessalonians 4 is lament that they didn't get saved before and get to go in the rapture. That's not going to be comfort to them. But they're going to be heavily all over the book of Revelation to see that there is an end. To see that even if they get martyred, it just means loss of human life, but they will be under the throne in heaven. They will see that they've got an eternal promise. They will see that they will come back and rule and reign in that millennium, that God will keep his word to Israel. They will have a kingdom on earth. They will be head nation. Messiah will sit on David's throne. He will reign from Israel. There will be a thousand years of peace. God keeps his word, but they're going to be seeing a different part. And Revelation especially is going to mean the most to them. So will 1 John. Is it 1 John or 3rd? I think it's 1 John that tells them not to take the mark of the beast or not to pray for one who does, that they can't even be saved because they've pledged allegiance to the beast. Remember, this isn't, and i got to say it, this isn't accidentally taking the vaccine, okay? People have innocently taken the vaccine. No. no one is going to innocently take the mark of the beast. They are pledging allegiance to the beast. And they the are beast bowing hasn't down come to yet. the beast. The no. beast hasn't come yet, so it can't no. be a so shot. So none of that is. No. And it's not it going to be yet. a shot. It's going to be a mark. We already see the precursors for what that could be. And when it's happening, they will know it. They will know if yeah, they, they take that know. mark. They, they will be able to buy and sell. They will be able to eat. They will be able to go on living the way they're living. But they will be giving up ever being right with God and being a part of, of what he has for them. Would they believe in him? So well, It's already happened. Look at how they're dividing us. If you don't get the, the vaccine, vaccine, you can't do this and you can't do right. that. So they're easing us. They're setting right. the stage yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Did we take a giant step in the pandemic to get a glimpse mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the tribulation? Yes. yes. And if we think this is bad, yeah. hello, yeah. get on the other side of the rapture in the that's tribulation, and it's going to be this on steroids. Yeah. And that's an taking understatement. Control. Because we're told it's the worst this fa the, the, the face of the earth has ever experienced. Uh, oh, thank God we're raptured before. Yeah. Hallelujah. Is it a crutch? No. Is it a rejoicing? Yes. <laughs> Yes, Roger. But just like when you're, if you go on TikTok and you look at things, and there once you see a little thing pop up says, did you vote for Trump or did you vote for Biden? And then did you take the vax, the vaccination shot? And I'm thinking the government could put this thing out and you could set it because on your cell phone, they know your cell phone numbers. And that's how they track everybody at the White House that was down there. So that you could say, yes, that thing goes back somewhere. It could go right back to the government. And then all of a sudden they got you down and you haven't taken the vax. If they ever do a quarantine thing for non-vaxxed people, it's stuff like that, you know, just an idea of what and can happen. It's an idea of what can happen, and again, this is yeah. nothing compared to the atrocities one after another during yeah. the tribulation. It's the wrath of God. Do right. I need to say anything more? Yeah. I would not want to be on that side of God. Oh. Yeah, we're about vaccine then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've got a friend that her daughter works in the medical field, 
and she's having her makeup fake IDs saying that they've had the, the vaccine and they haven't, but it isn't going to do her no good because now they're putting they're putting data in the shot, which is going to tell who's had it and who hasn't. And does had that it. data in yeah. the shot? We may have to find our own little Petra here in the states. Does that begin <laughs> to give you an idea of how the mark of the beast will be able to work, where they will know all kinds mm -hmm. of things? Absolutely. All of this shows us how close we are. Mm -hmm. That should excite you, people, not scare you. Look up, your redemption draws nigh. I'm going to close this in prayer. It's past 410. We can keep going. I'm not closing yeah, it may, off. May, but some of you have been waiting for me to close in prayer. May I, may I ask a question? Yes, Lena, go ahead. Yes, uh, in Philippians 1, 6 and 10, it says there, until the day of Christ. So is that, will that refer to uh, the rapture? The, until the day of Christ. The day of is Christ that, is not the day of the Lord. It is not the day of judgment. It is a day that, that's hopeful, a day of blessing. I believe I'm looking real quick. Uh, uh, I, Ephesians 1, 6, 1, 6. 1, 6 and 10. Okay, I don't get it in 1, 6. Um, 1, 10. 6. Philippians 1, 6. Ephesians? Philippians, Philippians. Philippians, thank you. Yeah, Philippians. My, my apologies. Philippians. I need to listen better. Um, I know the day of Christ is, yeah. The day of Christ, I'm, I'm hoping I've got my footnote here that I can tell you. Yeah, he began a good work in the until uh, the day of Christ. Okay, next week I'll give you the whole overall what all is in the day of Christ because there's certain criteria. I just looked at it last night that I'm, I'm fighting for my mind. But the day of Christ, yes, that is the day of our salvation that that would be when it says that, that he'll perform it until the day of christ till he takes us home yes um, um and okay, verse 10 again you. that we're found without any offense in that day yes day of christ and day of the lord are not synonymous and interchangeable they are not and the day of the lord rowena i am still working on whether it ends at millennium or whether it's to include millennium i have been doing my research I am seeing both sides, and I'm wanting something in Scripture to make me define where I land. So um, hopefully by next week I've got the answer to that. And I'm still working on Cornerstone. I haven't gotten there yet either. I had a lot this week and little time to research. So hang in there with me. Sorry for the delay, but I'm trying to get okay, there. Okay, okay, thank you. Day of Christ and Day of Lord, totally separate. Let me close in prayer real quick, but then the conversation could go on. We're not cutting you off, okay? Lord, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful class. Thank you for your spirit alive within us to encourage us in this class. Thank you for the promise, the hope of our going home to be with you at any moment in rapture. Lord, how we plead for the salvation of those around us who are not part of that body. How we want them to be able to be in the joys and the glory and in eternity with you forever and not have to suffer the persecutions of this earth as, it, as your wrath is poured out. But thank you. Even during that time, thank you, thank they you, can Lord. be saved, even though it'll be horrendous, they can be saved. Lord, we plead with, with Sha'al Paul and with your heart, may all of Israel be saved, and may the dear Gentiles also be brought into that saving knowledge and accept you. We praise you. We thank you for the gift we of our you. salvation and the sure hope, the no-so, that will be with you one day, soon and very soon. Hallelujah. Praise you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.